Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Before we start, could you? I would like to welcome you to all. Open your chat bar and type, uh, introduce yourselves and where you are today and what organization you're with. Um, for everyone who doesn't know me, I'm Charlotte. I am a communications advisor for Sustainable Seas, and I'm based in Wellington today. So... Hi, Shaw. Kia ora, Alex. Hauraki Golf Forum. Andrew Hammond from Waikato Regional Council. Hi, Liz from Fungatio Harbour Care. Oh, and they're coming in too fast for me to keep reading. So, <laughs> for everyone, if you just open your chat and have a look at and see everyone who's there. All right. Kia ora, Rebecca. Kia ora, Fraser. Awesome. Tan from Auckland Council. Awesome. All right. We have a great number of people here today. Okay. A few more minutes, a few more seconds, and then I will hand over to you, Conrad. One last thing before I hand over to Conrad is just a reminder that there will be a Q&A session at the end and this has been recorded. So for your Q&As, as, as you have them throughout the session, please submit them in the Q&A session window. So that's the little Q&A with the hand or the speech bubble. All right. Okay. I think we've given everyone enough time to jump in and they'll come along when they can. So... Conrad, over to you. Thanks, Charlotte. Tēnā koutou katoa. Welcome, everybody, to our webinar today. Um, it's great to see such a high level of interest in this topic, and we're really excited um, to be able to share with you some of our findings and learnings um, over the next little while. Um, so my name's Conrad Pilditch, and I lead the degradation and recovery theme um, within the Sustainable Seas National Science Challenge, and I also uh, am a researcher in uh, one of the projects that Simon will be talking about a little bit later. So could you just go to the, the next slide? I'm just going to give a brief introduction um, to the webinar today. So before we start, I think it's really important to acknowledge uh, especially uh, the research and the findings and the learnings that we're going to be sharing with you today has a long history of research in New Zealand. So just like to acknowledge the, the people that started on this project and these, this issue um, back in the late 90s and can continue to forward it. And it's an important part of the, the theme for the uh, sustainable seas as well. Um, this ch challenge has also um, supported a lot of this research in phase one during the tipping points project and also in phase two, the ecological responses to cumulative effects that um, Simon and Kuta lead. We also have to acknowledge our, our many collaborating partners, both within the challenge and those that have supported the work um, pre-challenge, uh, our iwi partners, uh, multiple councils across the motu, and also um, MFE dot New Zealand Fisheries MPI. So I'd just like to acknowledge those before we get started. Um, next slide, please, Simon. So as you may be aware, the, the challenge has a mission to enhance utilization of marine resources within um, environmental and biological limits. And ecosystem-based management approach has been identified as the mechanism of the tool which will allow us to maintain healthy ecosystems, but also have a thriving and healthy blue economy. Now, many of our current uses of the marine environment are extractive and also uh, generate stressor footprints that occur over many spatial and temporal scales. Often the activity occurs in one location and then its effects are spread in a hyperconnected environment to other places and in other times as well. And sedimentation is, is, is one of these issues. Although the problem is, is generated on land, the effects are impacting our coastal and estuarine environments. And if we're going to... Um, realize the challenge mission and have healthy ecosystems and a healthy thriving people and economies, we're going to need to understand the effects of many of these stresses in the marine environment and how they play out in order to maintain that healthy ecosystem. 
So understanding stress of footprints, understanding the cumulative effects of multiple stresses is a central theme and absolutely critical to EBM. So today's seminar is going to focus on, on one of the most pervasive um, stresses, the few stresses that are occurring in our uh, coastal and estuarine ecosystems. So we're hoping to cover today, um, Kura Fulberg from the University of Waikato. She leads um, Tangaroa T1 Afi Mai Afi Atu program, but also co-lead of the ecological responses to cumulative effects. Then we'll um, have Simon who's going to give us a, a rundown on, on sort of a summary of the biophysical uh, understanding we have to date um, from this uh, rich vein of research. Uh, Megan from Auckland Council has very kindly uh, agreed to join us and provide some management perspectives. And then Simon will finish up um, with some ideas and concepts that he's been pushing and others have been pushing in the literature around a more integrated holistic approach to, to some of these issues and management problems. So um, that's me done. I'm gonna hand it over to the experts now and welcome everybody um, to our webinar today. Thanks, Simon. Um, tēnā koutou katoa, rauranga te rā mako a tai mai nei, anō te mihi ki a koutou. Um, greetings everyone. So I'm going to share with you um, what the impacts of ground change in our coastal ecosystems might look like from a tangata whenua perspective. For many Māori, ngā tohu o te taiao, or the signs, signals, or environmental indicators of the natural world play a pertinent role in identifying trends uh, or changes in the state of marine ecosystems. It is understood, so tohu is, um, tohu, ngā tohu means the signs and signals and taiao is the natural world for that slide title there. It is understood that tohu are not isolated nor singular, that the world is holistic, multifaceted, cumulative, and connected. And so tohu have been used by generations of Māori to sustain and enhance mahinga kai. Um, mahinga kai can be described as traditional food harvesting uh, areas, uh, traditional food harvesting areas. So for us, tohu help show if ecological systems are getting better or worse and um, include some steps or strategies, if you like. One of the most pertinent is, how do we recognize, interpret, and respond to a contemporary changing science of the world? And from that, how then can we, as a collective, work together to help make sense of those changes um, as we look to an intergenerational past um, for any patterns or information that may help us to better understand the impacts on our uh, spaces, uh, which then leads us to kaitiakitanga or action, and the bringing together of dual knowledge systems to assist informed decision making and management action for the long term. Uh, thank you. Next slide. And so an example includes understanding the role of sediments which are um, causing change, like uh, these images here, which were taken in Ohiwa Harbour in the Eastern Bay of Plenty. In terms of mahinga kai, food harvesting areas, understanding the role of sediments as a driver of change has real world tangible impacts, not only ecologically, but um, on cult culturally as well. We are currently working with our iwi partners, Ngāti Awa and Te Upokorehe, um, Waikato University, Niwa, oh sorry, can you go back please? And the Bay of Plenty Regional Council to develop a, a habitat suitability index and 2D hydrodynamic model to assist decision making. Uh, the work has been co-developed, sorry, thank you, Simon, you can change, and um, co-implemented with our iwi partners. It is hoped that by using, by working together, oh, sorry, it is hoped that using cores along with other information uh, to date back a hundred or so years of sedimentation will assist um, Komata iwi concerns of changing conditions and the impact of that on our traditional food basket. Um, by including traditional iwi identified sites in the sampling regime, we enact mahitahi. So in this slide here, uh, we worked uh, extremely closely with our iwi partners. Every level, every stage of the work that we do is co-developed. And um, 
And we do that, not only is that important in terms of bringing together different knowledge systems to, to problem pose, to identify sites, to work together and to develop um, dual knowledge understandings, but it's also equally pertinent in terms of disseminating knowledge findings and outputs that are appropriate, accessible, and encourage active participation and contribution for the long term. Kia ora. So increased sediment, uh, suspended sediments and sedimentation and nitrification can be critical stresses to filter feeding bivalves, uh, of which, ma uh, which um, are in mahinga kai. A holistic Māori worldview of kaitiakitanga considers the well-being of natural resources to be directly related to the well-being of the people. So recognising, interpreting, and responding to contemporary tohu or environmental indicators is about working together to better understand the cumulative effects of sedimentation of mahinga kai, the harbour and ecosystem services. Thank you. Because the worst thing we could do is leave an empty food basket for our grandchildren of tomorrow. Kia ora. Kia ora, Kura. Um, hello, everyone. I'm now going to uh, talk to you a little bit about some of the research we've been doing on sediment impacts. I want to start with some of the earlier things that we've looked into um, and then bring you up to date with what we're currently doing. Um, as I do that, I'm, I'm really hoping that this fosters a productive discussion at the end of the webinar where we can talk about some of these issues. So we first started working on sediment impacts back in the 90s. We were really responding to some questions coming out of Auckland Council about um, what's happening with urbanisation and its impact on our estuaries. Um, we set about developing guidelines um, back then to look at what some of these um, depositional events were doing to the systems and, and what might be good and what might be bad. Um, we learned a lot from that process about the way the systems were changing and um, the potential for these long legacy effects that can um, occur as a consequence of these depositional events. As well as the deposition of um, terrestrial sediment into, onto the seafloor within the estuary of the coast, there's also a, a major problem associated with making the water more turbid. This is the suspended sediment concentration problem. This is quite difficult to study, of course, because it's a bit like, um, you know, counting clouds. It's cloudy on one day and it's not cloudy on another. And um, the effects of the suspended sediment concentration on the marine communities are, are quite non-linear. Um, so it's very difficult to predict what's going on. An illustration of that is that um, many bivalves can cope with quite a high load of sediment for a short period of time because essentially they can just hold their breath, but they're less able to cope with a much lower level of sediment extending over a long period of time. So with our understanding of these processes and the links between what's happening physically versus ecologically, um, linking those two things has been quite problematic. But we have learned that um, there's really no simple measure of suspended sediment effects. And we've also learned that average values are really not so meaningful in helping us understand impacts on these ecosystems and their biodiversity. I don't want to imply that um, the only sediment impacts we see occur within the muddy and sandy habitats within our estuaries. They are extending out into our coastal zone. Um, there's been quite a lot of research um, conducted over the years by Nick Shears of Auckland University, looking at how kelp forests are changing within the Gulf from the, the clear waters of the outer Gulf in, in towards the city. Nick's work also highlights some important things that relate to um, 
changes in ecosystem function. In, in this slide, he's talking about the capacity of the kelp forests to, to lock up carbon, um, which could be important in terms of how we develop our, um, our carbon budgets for a country that is, is largely marine state. This also opens up the question of, of how does the ecosystem work? And it also opens up the question of, there's more than one stress involved in here when we think about sediment impacts, as well as the fact that there are more things going on associated with, with climate change, plastic pollution, nutrient additions and fishing, and all those urban contaminants that come out of our cities. So these estuarine and coastal environments really are multi-use ecosystems. They subject for they are subject to multiple stresses. And so this leads us to think about cumulative effects. And what I wanted to do here was really highlight an ecological description of what a cumulative effect is. Um, cumulative effects have been mentioned from the beginning of the Resource Management Act, so they've been in our policy for a long time now. There is a difference in the definitions that I think of as an ecologist of what cumulative effects means and what the environmental lawyers think it means. And this really highlights a major disconnect between science and policy, um, something that we really need to think about fixing. The other thing I want to stress here is this isn't just a local problem. This is a global problem and it's recognised internationally as something that um, we all need to get much better at thinking about and, and looking to find solutions for. Uh, the woman in the slide here is Steph Mangan. She's one of Conrad Pilditch's PhD students who's been working on how light is affecting the productivity within estuaries associated with the microscopic plants that live on the sediment water interface. This is the major source of production in our estuaries and much of our coastal zone. And what you can see from a very quick summary of, of Steph's hard work is that um, as the tide comes in, when the water is full of suspended sediment, we really reduce the light levels and there we, therefore we really reduce the window of, of um, productivity for the microscopic plants. So now we can start to begin to think about what the consequences of this are, obviously for the food chain, but also beyond the food chain for other processes that go on within the system. And those are things that I'm going to talk about um, shortly. The slide is also important because it highlights that we can start to think about how these changes um, will be modified by climate change. In this slide specifically, we're talking about um, thinking about sea level rise. So again, um, trying to make the connections between different processes is, is really important to us. So if we're really gonna deal with these um, cumulative effects, I think it's important that we start to think about um, these systems from a systems perspective. And in this slide, what I wanna point out is that while um, much of what we're talking about is the biodiversity of the species, the attributes of the species that influence their capacity to drive different functions, those functions lead to different ecosystem services that are valued by different people in different ways. Um, and we need to develop systems that allow us to understand that and connect that um, social dimension to the ecology. But we also need to be thinking about how in those systems can we make them transparent so that we can understand the links between different people's values back to the state of the environment and the, and the species and the functions it contains? Because through that comes some deeper understanding of both how the systems work and, and therefore how we value it. So it is all about networks. And in a sense, it's about understanding how the system works as a prelude to understanding how we can fix it. So this simple illustration here summarizes a lot of complexity in the sediment 
and it really illustrates the role of two species of shellfish. There are many more species that live in the sediment. They are important too, but I'm keeping it simple. Um, the role of those microscopic plants that sit on the sediment water interface, um, the nitrogen cycle that's going on within the sediment. All of those things are important components of a network that um, interconnects multiple processes. And even this simple network here allows us to think about how stressors play out when we're looking at um, the effects of shellfish and therefore the impacts of fishing, the effects of sediment influencing the nature of the, the, um, the seafloor environment um, and the light levels coming to the seafloor, um, the influence of nutrients, and therefore we're thinking about eutrophication. So we've got these three major stresses in our systems, sediment, eutrophication, and fishing, that are all played out really within this very, very simple network. And this is really the, the network that we were focused on when we were thinking about trying to understand um, tipping points in the first part of the challenge. And the next couple of slides I'm gonna show you really relate to some of the, um, the implications of the research that we've done. And so the first slide is um, a, a summary cartoon of, of how the, um, the, the nitrogen cycle within the sediments is being changed by the addition or the change in grain size to um, have sand flats that contain more or less than 3% mud. So 3% mud is a very, very small addition of fine particles to a sand flat. Um, we're focusing on the nitrogen cycle here and the role that the large animals play in influencing the nitrogen cycle because um, the, the coastal zone is, is the major part on the planet that processes nitrogen and recycles it and returns um, nitrogen back to nitrogen gas in the atmosphere. It's about 70% of our atmosphere. So if we think about the problem of eutroph eutrophication, which is essentially a problem of pouring too much nitrogen in the system, then these coastal zones are really significant in um, helping to remove that nitrogen. So that's an important ecosystem service. So this particular piece of work, um, which was a study conducted in one particular estuary in, in the Auckland region, highlights this very low addition of mud influencing and changing the way the ecosystem works. This study was not alone. Um, it builds on work that were done by some of um, Conrad's students, namely Dan Pratt and Lisa McCartan, which also highlight this, and also by some work that myself and Judy Hewitt and Drew Laura and Niwa and some of our US colleagues have been doing. So there is a substantive weight of evidence here from a range of different studies that, that this is a, a meaningful level of impact and change in function. During the Tipping Points experiment, we conducted one massive study across New Zealand at all of these harbors and estuaries here and often with multiple sites. And we were really trying to look at how does turbidity, changes in water clarity, influence the capacity of the system to process nitrogen and, and the um, status of the biodiversity within those estuaries. We did this across New Zealand um, because we wanted to gather in um, multiple different conditions to see whether things were happening different down south than they are up north. All of those kinds of questions were important. The result of that experiment really highlights this issue of a tipping point, which is the snowballing runaway effects. You can think about this terrestrially as a situation where, you know, a forest fire starts in little patches. And when it's really, really small, it's potentially easy to dampen those fires down. Um, but when it catches hold and takes off, the problem becomes much, much larger. So here's the snowballing effect that, that we're seeing from this experiment. If we think of the shellfish within the sediment as being important large animals in the sediment that really affect the ecosystem function, 
part of that is this processing of nitrogen. As we add more nitrogen to the system, the risk of eutrophication um, increases and that makes the habitat less suitable for shellfish. So as the load increases, the capacity of the system to cope with the load decreases. And so we create the snowballing effect that means the system is, is runaway change. So that really influences the way we need to think about how we manage these systems quite deeply, because it's not really a simple cause and effect situation any longer. It's not really a case where we're pointing to um, one particular limit load is relevant to all of our estuaries because they're all at different states and stages along this trajectory. It's also highlighting that small changes can have big consequences. And again, that's often not the way we think about setting limits in, in the marine space. So if we summarize all of those things dealing with these loading of sediment to the seafloor, um, we can, we can start here with this 3% limit. Um, we can move up to a 10, 15% limit. Um, I've heard a number of managers talking about this. Uh, this limit, as far as I'm aware, comes out of the work that's been done on benthic health modeling, um, again, involving Auckland Council. And then we can move up to these limits where we start to add layers of terrestrial sediment to the seafloor and the consequences of those. And then, to a much more broader scale um, change in the concentration of mud within the estuary as a whole. As we move through these, um, the scale and the diversity of impacts increases. Um, and so as we think about how we manage these systems, we really need to be focusing our attention to, to dealing with the problems down here because here um, it's, it's simpler and we can affect change um, up here, the problems and the potential for long-term legacy effects is really, really quite, quite strong. So at this point, I'm going to hand over to Megan um, to talk to you about this from her perspective, and then um, I'll come back uh, towards the end of the talk and, and hopefully offer you some thoughts to think about how we might think about managing these problems into the future. Thank you, Simon. Um, just for those that don't know me, my role at Auckland Council is as a scientist rather than a planner. So my role is to take information like this and to think about how we can use it for informing management decisions. And also, um, I guess, dealing with a lot of questions that arise a lot when we see um, photographs like this. So what I thought I would do was just talk through some kind of real world examples that we've experienced that kind of illustrates some of the complexities that Simon's just talked about from the research. Um, so this photo is of sediment obviously reaching the coast. It's come from largely from a um, site works further upstream, but it's also picked up sediment along the way um, from stream banks and other sources as well. So obviously the first question when we um, something like this happens is how much is too much? And then we run into a whole lot of other questions like, well, what's there? what's already happened there, how long is it there for? Um, so it becomes very complex very quickly. Um, this might be a one-off event, um, but then it does lead to the question of if we have several of these one-off events, how many is too many? Um, and raising the question that we've um, been talking a bit about with climate change is whether our perspectives of rare events will change and we see more of these um, large scale weather events resulting in um, distribution of sediment to the coast more frequently. Um, and also thinking about whether um, there are lasting effects from these one-off or multiple events and cumulative effects, not just within um, time or within one location, but also if we think of the broader receiving environment, this might be a one-off in this location. In this case, this is the Hauraki Gulf. What's the cumulative effect of multiple inputs along that coast. Um, there may be one-off events in those locations, but they drain to a much wider environment and contribute to that wider sediment load, which raises the question of thinking about the scale of effect and whether we're dealing with a near effect of one-off delivery or adding to something much bigger than that. And therefore, what are our scale of controls that we can operate at as well? Uh, next slide. 
Uh, so that was quite a visible um, sediment delivery. We've also seen some um, shellfish uh, die-offs, which have been quite, uh, have made the headlines and have generated a lot of public discussion as well. Um, so that you get a headline of this around sediment delivery from a development um, with a resulting uh, shellfish die-off. Simon, next slide, please. Um, in this case, I just wanted to highlight the complexity. So yes, there has been, had been some sediment issues with a, a development along the coast, but this estuary also has long-term monitoring that shows over the last um, 10 plus years that increasing sediment um, impacts in those monitoring locations. Uh, we also had a week before that this shellfish die off occurred, um, one of the marine heat waves. So we had really high temperatures um, and quite low tides as well. And then testing of those shellfish by MPI showed uh, loadings of parasites and disease, um, whether they're related to the sediment or separate, and we don't know. Um, and also that the shellfish had recently spawned as well. So there's a number of things going on there that make it really difficult um, to determine you know, what really is driving the big tipping point that we've seen there. When did that start? Um, is it a recent event or is it something that's built up over time and we've just seen the manifestation of it really recently with these more visible events? Um, also the question of recovery, you know, what does recovery look like? Will we see recovery? Um, in this case, we've seen um, the shellfish numbers are, are coming back and we didn't see major effects in other species. So it makes it quite a complex story to think about what's happened in this case and then try and broaden that out to what will happen in other locations. Uh, next slide. So I just put this one up to think about um, the fact that it's not just one um, species that we're managing for. It's not a simple um, linear response between an input and a response in the system um, that people are part of that ecosystem as well. And they're just as complex as the, the mud question that we've been talking about. Um, that People have multiple viewpoints that they've come from multiple levels of understanding and um, they have different value sets that we need to be able to manage for as well. So I've got uh, mangroves up there and anyone in the sort of northern part of um, New Zealand will know that mangroves are an ongoing discussion around man um, managing mud and the role of mangroves in that or their response to mud. Um, but also seagrass is becoming something within Auckland that's got a discussion running around how mang uh, seagrass operate in muddy environments and that delicate balance between whether they're responding to or contributing um, mud and whether too much mud actually affects them as well. Um, so I think it's a, you know, it's a, a complex conversation. It's not just a, a trying to work out a, a limit that we can apply. And I think hopefully this is where sustainable seas um, sort of multidisciplinary approach can help us think about things from different perspectives and not just the, the mud question at hand. Next slide. Um, hopefully most people on the um, call are, are well aware of the Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment's um, report, which really pushed for much stronger management of estuaries, um, recognition of them and monitoring of them also. And we've seen this come through a little bit in the National Policy Statement um, refresh in 2020. Um, which recognises um, the link between estuaries as receiving environments to those freshwater management um, units. So I think this offers an opportunity in terms of making that link between land management and what ends up in the estuaries more explicit. But the same challenges that we've been discussing still are there. Um, it's not solved by putting it into a, into a policy. We actually need to think about how we do it. Um, there's lots of questions um, that arise, um, which are, some of which I've covered across, but also thinking about cost and benefits of different alternatives that we can take, um, particularly relevant for this conversation. If we have incomplete information, how can we use what we already have to inform our management? What are the feedback loops and secondary effects? So how complex is this? Um, for estuaries, you know, those historical impacts that have built up um, around the coast over a long period of time, multiple inputs of sediment and the fact that sediment moves around. So um, is not one kind of end point. And thinking of somewhere like Auckland, where we have many, many estuaries of different scales and sizes, can we apply the same rules to all those or, you know, how do we take that approach? Just 
highlighting that I think risk and uncertainty are really critical parts of the conversation, understanding what we're managing for and being able to communicate that uncertainty when we're talking with, with decision makers so that they can understand um, you know, just how certain we are around the information and what it means and how they can take that on board. And I guess a question to pass back to, to Simon to think about in terms of this, this piece of work. We know that estuaries, we can see they're not just something at the end of the pipeline. They're not a simple bucket that just fills up and then we, we put a limit on that. And they aren't all the same. So how can we take um, the research that's coming out of this program, as well as thinking about a more systems approach with people as part of that, um, to, to really manage estuaries as estuaries and the complexities that go with them. I'll pass back to Simon. Okay, thank, thanks, Megan. Um, I'm conscious that we are uh, moving through time here, so I'm, I'm going to speed up a little bit in, in this um, last two slides that I have to present to you. Um, really, I think... What I'm trying to do here is really start a conversation because answering the kinds of questions that Megan's been challenging me with um, is something that we we really need to do, but we all need to do it together. Um, and uh, so as we do that as an ecologist, then my thoughts start thinking about, well, what, what have we learned ecologically that might represent some principles about um, the system that we can use to inform our practice. And I think we do know that um, we need to get serious about moving towards managing cumulative effects. Um, we know that national guidelines are insensitive to cumulative effects. Um, we know that one size fits all measurements are unlikely to protect us against tipping points. Um, we know that meaningful action is desperately needed, um, both to affect change in our histories and to advance integrative management strategies. We know that the windows of opportunity are really closing on some of our ecosystems in the space. In terms of practice, uh, one of the things I think this means is we need to get serious about focusing on coasts and estuaries. They aren't simply a downstream um, element of freshwater management. Um, we need to set limits differently for different places. We need to use our knowledge of the systems, um, both their current status and the potential that they have for recovery and change. We need to think seriously about employing precautionary principles. We need to avoid creating set and forget policies. So what I mean by this is where policymakers uh, write their legislation, consider the job to be done um, and then step away. And then we fail to see um, actions as a result of that. Um, I, that's a major challenge that we face um, and something that we need to overcome. We can use marine spatial planning tools and risk assessment tools. They're important assets in terms of thinking about management decisions, but they really do need to incorporate these cumulative effects processes. We need to reframe a lot of our management to think about, let's enhance the resilience of our ecosystems to change because we know it's coming. And in all of this, it's a zero sum game, whether we're talking about the budgets we have or the time that we have or the capacity of our estuaries and coastal ecosystems to respond to change. Um, so we can't afford to waste it. And in all of that, um, it all highlights the need for us to be thinking about implementing ecosystem-based management. Um, and I think the one thing we've learned is that um, the current bureaucratic structures we have that don't talk to each other are really not helping us do that. Okay, Conrad, over to you. Thanks, Simon. Um, and thank you for our speakers. Um, I just wanted to leave, leave you with some key messages that we've kind of come up with and sort of some take-home points, I guess. And, I guess the, the first one is hopefully you all realise by now that, that mud as a stress is a complex, multifaceted issue um, in terms of its effects on the ecosystem and the drivers that cause it. 
Um, as we've seen from the presentation today, it doesn't take a lot of mud to begin to impact um, ecosystem functioning. As our, as our understanding has improved over time, and we've looked at different components of the ecosystems, we're seeing effects occurring a lot further down um, than we initially thought. There's still a lot to learn, um, although we've been working on the problem for a while now, there's significant knowledge gaps still exist and Simon's highlighted and Megan have both highlighted the complexity and the interactions of sedimentation and turbidity with other stresses, whether it's marine heat waves killing cockles or whether it's nutrients entering into our estuaries. And one of the big challenges often I see into the future is translating what a lot of the catchment loading that the modelers are delivering um, to help planning into impacts in estuaries and the context or the estuarine characteristics that those loads are being delivered into. And there's some big gaps in understanding there. Um, both um, Megan and Simon have highlighted um, this concept that estuaries are just not a, a receiving environment, much like a lake. They receive, they process, they export, but they also interact with the coastal environment and they need to be managed in their own entities, re recognizing all of that complexity both the inputs from the land, but also the inputs and interaction with the ocean and the activities that are causing stress within the estuary itself. Um, and we need to sort of to moving towards a, a management, we need to recognize this and um, begin building understanding. And I think could have provided a, a pathway forward in terms of the co-development of research on the ground with people in those estuaries with iwi and hapu um, to assist kaitiaki tanga and beginning to come back to those values and what are we managing for. And this idea of co-development and bringing together people, I think is really at the center of EBM. And in particular, breaking down those structures, whether it's managers working with Hapu and Iwi, whether it's scientists working across divides with policy and managers, um, that's, we've got to break down these barriers to get a much more holistic view of, of management of what is a, a very, very complicated system and complicated um, issue. And if we don't get there, as Simon pointed out towards the end of his talk, you know, we're just managing a continual decline, but there's still some hope. Just put the last slide, it's up there, Simon, please. So we've assembled some homework for you. You thought you're getting away just by listening to us. And, um, you know, there's been hundreds of papers written on the topic of mud and, and, and all of them written around effects and impacts um, in New Zealand by a long research base and distilling it down to kind of five things that we think everyone should read and think about whether you're a manager or a coastal scientist was quite difficult because everything we've, everything that's been done is important in our mind. But we've left you with five things and, and Charlotte will make the presentation available uh, for people and you can follow the hyperlinks to these papers. But it's some work that Kurt has done on co-development of research with Iwi and Ohiwa Harbour. There's some um, earlier papers from Simon where uh, and co-authors where they outline the, the actual nature of the, the sedimentation problem in our estuaries. A couple more recent papers um, dealing with tipping points and cumulative effects that we've touched on today. And, and a paper that is um, how we manage the tipping points and, and how we can work across um, the science policy uh, management divide um, to avoid um, these kinds of things. It provides a, a framework um, for moving forward. And I, I couldn't keep it to five, so we had to slip in one last paper at the end there. And it's an opinion piece that was written from some of our emerging uh, researchers that came out of the Tipping Points project as they got together in a workshop to think about in all of this complexity, we're never going to have a model that will be fit for purpose in terms of a biophysical model because it'll be too big, too large and too cumbersome. So what are some ways forward that we can actually take the understandings that we have from a Mataranga perspective, from a biophysical perspective and our understanding of how people behave and begin to integrate that expert opinion um, to make decisions and um, there was some big play for um, using these Bayesian network analysis and some work has begun on that within MIWA to be doing with that and there's already some work underway with Hawke Bay Regional Council um, about how they may use those Bayesian network models for management. Um, so I'll leave you with that. Oh, there's one more slide, Simon. Yeah, there's a couple of resources that we've pulled together on our recent research um, based on monitoring for tipping points that Judy Hewitt led with Simon a summary of some of the recent papers to come out of the interactive effects between turbidity and nutrients in our estuaries from that tipping points experiment. And the links are all there um, to the web page, um, the Sustainable Seas web page. And that's me done. Hand it back to Charlotte to manage the questions. Thank you, everybody. 
Kia ora, Conrad. Thank you all. Um, oh, Simon, could we get that slide back just for people to look at? Um, thank you. All right, so we've got some great questions coming through. I just wanted to check in with Shaw. I see you've got your hand up. I'm going to allow you to talk, presumably to ask a question. You can do that. So please ask your question. Sorry, I uh, no, it was a, a really good and interesting um, bunch of presentations. No, I, I accidentally hit the hand up, so I don't have questions, but I'm right. happy to, I'm wanting to listen to everyone else's. Thanks. Okay, great. Thank you, Shaw. All right, first question we've had come through is from someone who's anonymous, and that's on the Q&A window. Simon, I see your question and it's in my list. So as the questions come in, I'll go through them that way, first in, first served. All right, first question. It sounds like what the problem, we know what the problem is, which is too much sediment from land, and we know what to do. I guess this is to all the speakers. What do you think the barriers to action are? You mentioned policy interpretation of RMA. And what do you think social science can do to help? I can take a first stab at that if you like. Um, I think one of the things where social science can help is, like I said, is that conversation with people um, around what we're managing for, what the levels of risk and uncertainty are and the information. I think one of the barriers to moving forward is kind of when you put some of these measures in place, there are costs associated to people with those. Um, and therefore um, we have to have a level of certainty for some actions. Um, and so it's about moving the community forward as a whole to agree what they want and to be able to deal with different levels of, of certainty of information so we can move forward in some directions without absolute certainty because we want to move in a particular direction. We know that much and we can move, we know enough to start moving down that pathway. Um, so I think it, that's where social science can really help bring together different um, viewpoints and values, but also that understanding of um, what we need to move forward, what information we need and how we work when we don't have all the information we need, but we do have a goal of where we want to get to. Can I, can I add on to that? Um, to that um, thank you, Megan. I think in terms of social science, we can um, actively engage in transdisciplinary research that promotes co-developed um, questions and understandings uh, not only with community, but also with uh, hapu and iwi, so that we implement and include intergenerational place-based information and questions to assist um, the real-life meaningful understanding of ground changes and how that impacts uh, the wider ecosystem services of a harbour, but mahinga kai um, for the long term. Kia ora. Okay, and the next question from Fraser. Where do we establish a bottom line of ecosystem health and how do we go about returning the environment to this level? For example, what role do hard engineering solutions like silt dredging and mangrove removal have in this pathway to a more functional harbour? Maybe I can have a first cut at this. Um, we do, we don't have a, a, a very rock hard um, kind of benchmark for ecosystem health uh, because it is quite a complicated issue and it does vary from place to place. Um, and remember, we're talking about estuaries, which are, are, are in geological timescale transitory features. Um, so I don't think that we should be trying to get that solid benchmark, we can see trends um, and we can compare between systems and all of those things make health assessments possible. Um, I think what, what role for engineering um, is, is probably, when you think of it, uh, pretty minimal. Um, we can certainly think about, you know, where we're putting um, channels and bridges and um, stop banks and so forth and, and their implications, for example, in, in the scene in front of you. But if we think about the Haraki Gulf and all the sediment that's drained out of the Haraki Plains over the last 
um, few thousand years that's in there um, to try and restore that to conditions that it may have been in um, a thousand years ago would involve moving millions of cubic kilometers of mud. Um, the disturbance associated with that would be massive. And we would then have the problem, assuming that we could afford it and we were going to take the climate hit of um, burning that much diesel to move it, where are we going to put it? Um, so I think in a lot of these cases, we need to be thinking about engineering in a, in a much more working with nature framework than the usual kind of hard structure, concrete, dig it up and move it somewhere kind of way. I was a quick comment following on from Simon there, Fraser. Um, I think, in a lot, as Simon alluded to, it's hard to know where the baseline was. And in a way, um, because the catchments have been altered so much and we're unlikely to go back to 90% coverage of, of native trees and fauna, the idea that the estuaries will come back to some baseline is probably um, not realistic. And I think the better way to think about it is we have a baseline now if we've monitored our estuaries and assessed the values and health of those estuaries. And I think what we should be thinking about is a trajectory where those, um, those things are improving through time. Um, and, and if they're improving through time, I think that's where we really need to be heading as opposed to we've got to return it back to some, for some preconceived ideal. And so as Simon was saying, working with nature and looking for improvements in what we have is probably a good way to think about it. Awesome. Thank you, Conrad. Does anyone else want to comment on that one? No. Okay. Next up, um, I'm going to go to Nadine's question. Um, in terms of management and in restoring and enhancing the ecological health and Māori of our estuaries and coastal ecosystems, we know there are lots of community groups or siloed organisations working in that space. Is there any kororo from those here, so from the speakers, around the importance and ability to bring these groups together to respond to the ecological effects in these environments? Commenting on the co-development and co-management space. I guess I can make a, a quick start on that. Um, just that obviously the yeah, it's a matter of scaling up some of these activities and the only way to do that is to draw them together and to find meaningful ways to do that. Um, within Auckland Council, there are a number of um, support networks for, for supporting community groups and particularly around networking them and making sure that we're joining those efforts up. Um, I think there's a lot more work to do in that um, starting from the bottom up in terms of co-development and co-management space, but in terms of joining activities that are already underway, there are, there are some mechanisms to do that. Um, in Ohiwa Harbour in the Eastern Bay of Plenty, in the co-development and co-management space, um, they have a non-statutory Ohiwa Harbour implementation form, which is very proactive and positive. And uh, that form is um, uh, informed, if you like, by um, the work that's on the ground with uh, Hapu Iwi um, for the projects that we have in sustainable seas. So I don't know if I answered your question, but... Um, but there are, there are pockets out there um, engaging in co-developed co-management spaces or co-developed spaces towards co-management, I should say. Okay, I've got a couple of questions that might be answered at the same time, one from Natalie and one from someone who's also anonymous. Um, essentially, are there any management actions in place now that can help reduce sedimentation? in estuaries at the moment. Maybe I can have a first cut at that and then Megan can cor correct my errors. Um, actually, there is, it, it's quite variable around New Zealand as to what's being done. I think that's an important point to bear in mind. And, and often that variability um, appears to correlate quite strongly with how, diff how much different councils rank the importance of their coasts and estuaries versus other systems that they have to manage. Um, 
there have been a lot of very, very simple things that have been done, um, not expensive things that have been done that really do help. Uh, it, in Auckland, if you drive around areas where there's um, urban development, motorway reconstruction, you'll often see things like little bays of hail um, blocking sediment from flowing down drains. You'll see straw or other material being put on bare dirt um, so that when the raindrops hit it, it doesn't immediately run off. So, and you'll see sedimentation ponds with, um, which are accumulating material. Um, I don't wish to imply that they work perfectly because as some of Megan's slides show you, they can fail sometimes, but, but they do help. And then more generically, um, we have people looking at repairing and restoring our riparian zones. Um, again, that's influencing uh, the potential for sediment transport. Um, a lot of the sediment that runs off our landscape comes from the consequence of having short and very episodically flowing streams and rivers. Um, that that's, defines New Zealand's landscape really. And um, so managing those landscapes and, and reducing the potential for landslides on those landscapes is, is the biggest challenge in, in dropping the sediment load. But, but we are talking about those kinds of things and there are places where people are starting to revegetate. But when you think about how many rivers and streams there are in New Zealand, and you think about some simple actions that could be undertaken, um, there's lots of things that we could do right now that wouldn't be that expensive, um, that would be helpful. But if we were to try and restore a riparian margin um, around all of our streams and rivers, we would be looking at millions of kilometres of stream margin that we would need to restore. Well, thanks, Simon. Um, yeah, just picking up on that in terms of the sediment earthworks controls, I think that's a, a ongoing um, improvement that we're always trying to improve how sediment is managed in terms of earthworks. In terms of actively restoring, I think there's lots of examples around the country where there are sort of catchment based programs um, being undertaken and um, MFE and through the government identified a number of priority catchments around New Zealand for um, that sort of large scale um, restoration type work, including the Kaipara Harbour. Um, I think the questions though that arise from that is that, you know, how much do we need to do to start turning things back? What scale do we need to operate at to be really effective at, at um, restoring some of these larger issues that we have? And also, I think there's still a gap in understanding what effective and what's not and in terms of a longer time frame um, we're, we're quite good at setting up um, lots of sort of activities to improve the environment but not all of those are tracked very well to the end to see what the outcome is and that makes it again quite hard to sell these types of things if we don't have the hard information to show the the benefits and those benefits are over quite a long time scale you know we took decades to fill these places up with mud um, it's not going to be a quick fix. So um, people have to kind of hang in for the long haul to see the outcomes. All right. Thank you, Megan. Um, I'm going to jump over to Simon's question, which is in the chat, which is very related to the ones just asked. Um, under the example of mud input being restricted through those management controls, Simon's question is about... Um, does wind-driven turbidity in combination with tidal current flow remediate the accumulated mud? And does that have an, uh, is there scope for remediation through, I guess, I don't understand that question. So I will ask, ask the panel to answer that one. Um, I, I think, Simon, you're raising a good point with respect to the role that waves and currents play in the redistribution of turbidity. So in essence, what you're probably interested in the long term is the amount coming into the estuary versus what's exported out. But a significant percentage of that is remobilized whenever there's a mesoscale wind event that will move mud up onto sand flats. And so the, the internal hydrodynamics of the estuary become, and its interaction with tides and climate become really important as to where that, that mud actually ends up, whether it's resuspended and ends up outside onto the shelf. And that in itself is not really a solution to the problem because although it's diluted, 
often the communities that are in those coastal environments are more sensitive to mud, so you need a little, a smaller amount of it to impact change. And Simon referred to some of the work that Nick Shears was doing on the impacts of turbidity on kelp forest production as an example of that. So again, this, this sort of idea that it's remobilized and it's a way of getting rid of it through, through wave action, it, it's going to be very, very context specific depending on the estuary, the morphology, where the wind's coming from. And we see in places like the Manukau, for example, um, really nice sand flats, but the, the mobilization of that, to, of that mud lower down on the shore generates a, a turbid plume every tide that limits um, primary production on those flats. So uh, again, it, it's, it's hard to predict um, what will happen and how, how the system will, will respond to that. I don't know if I've answered your question very well. It's complicated. Thanks, Conrad. I just want to let everyone know it has just gone past 12, but if the speakers still have a bit of time, um, we can stay on for a few more minutes to answer the remaining questions. So speakers, is that okay? Um, Conrad? Conrad, yeah, okay. Oh. I could only see Conrad. All right, so question from Glenn. Thanks panel. What do the panelists see as the role of community-based projects, especially hapu and wider community co-management initiatives? For example, Ahu Moana. I'm, I'm happy to start um, that conversation. Um, I see the role of um, hapu wider community projects as um, pertinent actually. Um, uh, as well, I was talking earlier about the project in Ohiwa Harbour, that project is led, uh, the Sustainable Seas Project Afimaya Fiatu is led by Hapu and Iwi. It's supported by two district councils, a regional council, three wider communities, and also community members who have helped to um, co-develop tools and resources that we've used to try to better understand and manage um, or care for and manage our harbour into the future. So uh, for me, the role of community-based um, projects um, led by the people that live there and have lived there for consecutive generations is, is a pertinent space to, to look at. Kia ora kura. All right. Um, we have a question from Elizabeth Allen, which essentially is, in, can anyone on the panel talk to sort of the difficulties around regulation about what goes on in our estuaries? Megan, from the council's perspective, you might have a, uh, some thoughts on that. Um, yeah, so I'm probably not the best person in council okay. to answer that, but I can, I mean, one of the issues is actually identifying, I think, when it's happened, where, how it's happened and who has done it. Um, where it has occurred and it is against rules, I think there are mechanisms in place to do that. Why it takes, you know, sometimes a bit of time, you know, probably a number of issues for that, but I'm not the best person to answer on that one. Thanks, Megan. Um, all right, I'll go on to the next one. Um, it is an anonymous question. Are contamin contaminants such as heavy metals and sediments monitored impacts assessed and sources identified? Um, Go, Megan. I was just going to say that um, Auckland Council and I think quite a few other councils do definitely monitor um, contaminants, particularly those associated with um, stormwater right across the region. So Auckland Council monitors that over 180 sites we have contaminant data for um, and through the benthic health models um, that Simon's mentioned, we look at that in terms of impacts on those systems and the interplay between sediment and contaminants. Obviously, those two often go hand in hand in terms of those contaminants being attached to the fines. Um, so yes, we definitely do look at that. Um, probably within the Auckland region, the, the sediment issue swamps a lot of the contaminant issue for many locations, or at least interacts really strongly with it. Um, I guess the other point I just make though is that's looking at kind of the contaminants that we know about. There's a lot more new contaminants coming in that we really don't know a lot about how they're going to have an effect in terms of emerging contaminants. Sorry, Simon. No, it's, that's, that's good. 
All right. I think we don't have any more questions. Steve, I see your, your question. It's quite a big one, and I might have to um, ask you to connect with the panellists offline because that's, that's a pretty big one, um, and we've run out of time. So I want to thank the panellists, all four of you, for working on this presentation and presenting today. Really appreciate your time, and thank you for the really interesting perspectives um, and learning, for me, learning about the, diff the complexities of mud in our estuaries. So thank you all. Um, and thank you everyone for attending. I hope you enjoyed. And just so everyone knows, this webinar has been recorded and will be made available and sent round in the next 24 hours. I'd also like to um, put a plug in for our newsletter. If you haven't signed up, there will be a link for that as well. Um, through that newsletter, you'll get updates on our upcoming resources. So more guidance based on some of the science that the panelists have talked about today. We've got um, development of that and some future webinars as well. So thank you all so much and enjoy your day. Ka kite.